and training, if you will. And so uh, teaching itself is so complex. You know, people who think that teaching is simple, I have a friend, uh, Michael, who got his terminal degree, a PhD in, edu uh, in, in economics. And he called me up and he said, Jeffrey, I got my first job. I said, really? Uh, congratulations. I assumed it was a bank. You know, it was at, uh, at Queens College. It was Queens College in New York City, part of the University of New York. What are you teaching? Economics 101. I said, Michael, uh, you know, how are you going to teach? He goes, what do you mean? What do you mean? I have, I have a, a room of 125 students, you know, an oratorium. I have a podium. I have my notes, and I give over. Teaching is giving over. And I presume, you know, there'll be questions, I'll ask the questions, and I'll give them a final. That was teaching. Teaching was giving over information. It's where Paulo Freire, Paulo Freire, which is a, a very brilliant uh, Brazilian educator, was, um, he said, he referred to that as the banking concept of education, where teachers are seen as, the, as depositors of information into a passive bank. Students are passively listening as you are and accepting the information without ever checking for understanding, without ever engaging students in active activities. And most, a lot of teaching occurs that way in classrooms from kindergarten through graduate school, certainly through grade, grade 12. Maybe my, someone might posit that graduate school might be different as expected. After all, they call us professors, not teachers. You know why they call us professors? We profess we know something, and we're getting it over to you. And therefore, there's no reason for asking you know, many questions or checking for understanding here in graduate school. To me, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's not a very effective model of teaching, but be that as it may. Uh, certainly in K-12, it does not happen. Teaching is certainly complex, difficult, and demanding. Why teachers fail, what research shows, teachers fail and leave within the first three years very often. Probably the number one reason uh, Richard says, is, is, is the third bullet from the last, classroom management issues, the inability to deal with management issues. They're content knowledgeable, they're passionate, they're, uh, they, they want to be a teacher, and they expect students to be you know, third graders and seventh graders and twelfth graders to be there as passive recipients, when they're not. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a matter of, of, of having them prepared to, to deal with classroom management. I would presume that would be a large part of your responsibility. Not to expect that they come in with this plan for managing their classroom, but that you will help them refine their plan. Do they have a vision of what a good classroom looks like? Remember, has to mention the fact that there, there, are, there, there are students' classrooms where teachers need to have students sitting straight. Sometimes students feel free to get out of their seats. How do you feel about that? And, 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 and is that okay? Do you have rules? Do you have procedures to give out paper? How do you give out paper? There are ways of doing it, the ways that are better than others. You know, there are ways of going over rules and generating rules and evolving class and developing those rules that, that, that need to be communicated. So teachers leave because they feel isolated, they lack, lack support. Supervisors, we tell them, they, they're usually given the toughest assignments. When I began teaching, I was given the bottom class, it's called the bottom class, with the toughest discipline problems. Why? I was young and strong. <laughs> Okay? And, and of course, the experience teachers tell you, we don't want that. You know, we, we, we don't want you know, those, those students. That's the worst thing to uh, possibly you know, think, think to give a new teacher. They're almost destined to fail, you know, uh, in that, that quote. Uh, fear of that, who's evaluating me? You know? Is that, is that really told and what that, what, what that entails? Uh, Etc. And of course, other reasons. So, okay. Oh, Joey, Joseph. Induction. So there is not, there is not a, a consensus in the field of what induction is. So I'm going to share with you my view of induction. It's not necessarily you know, the, the way. It's the way I conceive of induction. Uh, so induction is not just for new teachers. Okay? Not just the beginning teachers. It's not a crash course you give them in a workshop uh, you know, uh, uh, in teaching. It's not momentary. It's not episodic. It's not standalone. You're, the mentoring program that you're in should be part of a larger effort within a school. Now, this Legacy Heritage Foundation focuses specifically on the mentor-protege-supervisor relationship. But our vision in the Institute, I don't think you, you met Dr. Scott Goldberg, who's our, direct, who's our director of the Institute, has a vision 
of working with a school to take them beyond the mentoring protege, and that's just one, one component, but rather we're looking for the school to change transformationally so that mentoring occurs not just for beginning teachers, for a second and third year teachers, but that teachers who are there 10, 15, 20 years can learn too in different ways. So how can we, in the Institute, work with the school, build capacity, build leadership in the school so that learning occurs at, through all aspects uh, in the school, through the supervision, which you defined on your paper, through induction, through professional development, through mentoring. And so one of our responsibilities, especially now in, in the schools that are in the second year, we're now working more closely with the principals to have to build that capacity of leadership and learning throughout the school. Your role right now for the first year is really a focus to make successful that mentor-protege relationship. But our goal, our vision, is to transform your school. Now, now I'm sure you, 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 you are in great schools already, okay? But I don't know of, of a school that is, that, that, is, that, that is in utopia. Even the best school I've ever seen can improve. And so therefore, our goal is not to come in with the answer of how to improve, but really to work with the school to talk about what's unique about the school. How can we build this professional learning community so that we can uh, improve teaching <coughs> in that school that's pervasive, that everyone sees themselves as a learner? And what is best practice? What does research, research tell us of how to go about doing that? And we share that and we, co we converse with them. We don't dictate. Okay. And ultimately, it's, it's up to the school whether they want to uh, know that model or, and, and, learn, and learn from others, you know, other ways of doing things as well. Can you measure success? Okay. That's a good question. Okay. So I'll ask you a question. As a teacher, how, how will you, how, as a mentor, mentoring your protege, how will you mentor, how will you measure, quote unquote, measure success of that teacher? Let's start, start with, before we start with school success, success, let's talk about the protege success. How will you know that he or she is succeeding? I feel she has a good you know, class management, if the students are learning, if they're producing, if um, after they're being assessed, you know, they're able to perform well. How do you know? What does it look like? Can be more specific. You know, is it, they're, they're learning. It's calm, you know, it's orderly, it's... Um, so learning can't occur if, it, if it's chaos um, and not orderly? Chaos? I don't know. Well, okay. Organized chaos. <laughs> organized chaos? Yeah, organized okay. chaos. Sounds better. Okay. Um, Well, particularly, you identified certain areas that need improvement at the beginning, and you focus on those areas. And if you see that what you still need improvement, to actually improve. I mean, that's, you're looking for success. Success means that you made a difference. Mm -hmm. Not that things are okay, but specific things that were not okay or need improvement at the beginning. Some of them really got better. One of the things we'll be, we'll be starting a little bit here, but more when we work with you in the school sites, actually developing goals and objectives mm -hmm. uh, with your protege. So measurable goals, like end of, end of year goals, but also interim goals, what you expect. And so therefore, it, it's quote unquote measurable. Well, a lot of it is also very, uh, you know, not, not qualitative, not very quantitative. Please. I think we can be successful um, if we see that there's differentiation. So that we give our protege the right to try things, to, to be experimental. I mean, now's the time to do it with people watching and seeing and, and giving some input. No, please. Okay, that was good. So, I'm sorry, so your point was if we see differentiation? Mm -hmm. was it? So that so that we see that the protege is trying different things so that they don't get stuck in just one way of teaching because they might find out what's uncomfortable in the beginning becomes very comfortable and or maybe they find out that, you know, this just doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. But as teachers, we probably do that all the time. We're just not so, oh, yes, I'm doing this now. It just happens. Mm -hmm. We tell our kids are guinea pigs. Right? We can give them trying different things, you know, and, and the kids don't know what to expect because I have, I have this new teacher who wants to try and have a different teaching style so I mean, in, in one month. I don't know how good, and I'm just concerned about what the students are doing. and how they going to respond to that. But you have to teach in different styles all the time. You have different learners. But that's that's true, but you still have to be a teacher that has some level of predictability, I think. So, right. Like, the, the, like, your level of consistency. Yeah, this your expectations. You're doing, mm -hmm. uh, setting up the classroom in such a way that they know, you know, 
even if you're changing it drastically, as long as you're very clear in how you're changing and what your, ex your expectations for them, there's no reason they should be able to follow yeah. along. I, I would just say for success, if you if you have access, and it's probably for older students, to what do the kids say? Kids, mm -hmm. older kids have a pretty good handle on what's going on. They know the difference between the class that's fun, and but you don't learn anything, and a class that's serious, but we like the teacher. And I would say that there might be one of your minds to a better success. Ryan, they get through all the small days. I just want to say that that's extremely dangerous. Um, I don't know what school that you're in, but I've taught in um, Florida and now in LA. And Maybe they're just bigger communities, but, um, and this was actually on the board I had taken up, we didn't have time. It says, students come to me to complain about my protege, what is my responsibility, how do I handle this? Um, so I can tell you that we had this twice this year, that I think most kids, every time there's a new teacher, there's flood, excuse me, fresh blood, especially in the middle school years, they're going to jump on it, they're going to try to see what they can get out of this teacher. And if you don't show 100% support and you don't really stand behind this teacher, oh. obviously if there's a gross... No, I didn't mean that. Yeah, I understand that 100%. I think I, if, you, if you give kids an avenue, if you give them an opening, they will say whatever they think that either you want to hear or what they can get away with and what they think they're going to have a good time with. So I think that they have to know that first and foremost, you know what's going on in that classroom. If you want to, you know, some kids you might have a relationship with, you might feel this is a very intelligent child, you trust them socially, right? you know, very developed. Right. But I think that's a very big, I mean, from what I've seen in my experience, no, but, but it's very he said that depends on the level of the class. You don't ask, you know, if it's in high no, but school. But if you have an abusive, manipulative, upper, uh, you need to know your students. Right, you could have a kid who will, yeah, who will try to get back at that teacher and make yeah, sure that there are, that there are students that you still have one or two students that you can really trust. Right. But I think you yourself have to be in that classroom to really see what's going on. Sure. Um, you know, I, it sounds like we're talking about assessment in terms of what's happening in the classroom. And, you know, like we're talking about, you know, if the, if the students are, are learning or if there's differentiation in the classroom or, you know, we're asking the students how they're, how they're doing. Uh, to me, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to kind of wrap my mind around this. The, the mentoring that we're doing is really supporting the teacher in developing into a successful, the word was used before, practitioner. Right, successful practitioner, successful um, professional. That may or may not be fully observable in the classroom, but there's growth. Of course, if the, you know if the, the teacher has you know gone from from zero to 160 seconds, then you'll see you know you'll see that growth in the classroom. And but really, what we're working with is is are we really catering to the development of this? individual as a professional. So you won't always see that in the field fully. Um, you know, there'll be good days, there'll be bad days. Um, sometimes you'll take two steps forward and one step back and so on. So assessment, you know, if we think, I think of things in terms of understanding by design. So the enduring understanding is not necessarily like the what we want in the classroom, what the classroom the enduring understandings are not pointed to the students, but rather they're pointed to the to the mentor as a professional. Just right? Just please, please. I, I feel like if you want to watch a successful teacher, watch the students. The students will tell it, tell it all. What are the students doing when the teacher is teaching? Are they, observed, are they absorbed? Are they in their own world? Are they acting up? Are they interested? Are they curious? Watch the students, and you can evaluate the teacher. In my opinion, I just. Um, but there's your question. I agree. In your school, the schools you're in now, have there been prolonged conversations among faculty, at faculty meetings or gatherings or retreats or what PDs, on what does quality teaching look like in our school? We're just beginning. This is the beginnings of the conversation here. That's what needs to be done. In the schools we're working with, I rarely, if ever, have found consensus in a school, whether from the head of school, assistant principal, to the t teachers in different disciplines, to tell me, what does quality teaching look like? What are you looking for in a quality teacher? What does success mean? So I think that there is no one answer, but we could say 
in isolation of the context of a school situation or a classroom. This is a conversation that needs to be, and one of the things we work with in schools to help them transform their vision of becoming a professional learning community is, what does quality teaching look like? And we encourage principals and boards to get together, and teachers to get together, to talk about, you know, what, what, are, the, what, what are the criteria for quality teaching? Now, that may not be done by September in your school, but in the meantime, you and your protege will should have that, those conversations. The first part of, of the relationship is building trust. Not do's and don'ts, building trust and talking and listening and sharing. That their voice is, is being heard, their fears. They, 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 they feel comfortable in sharing their fears with you, because they trust you. And they can talk about, well, what do you expect of me? You know, how do I know if I'm successful? And you share with them that. So this is a, it's a larger question, and, and we can barely spend a whole period on, on just discussing what, this question. But I allowed, I allowed it to go because I want to make, make this point. These are conversations that are so important that need to be continued in this school. So but I think, I think if you don't mind me stopping, but I think this question is a very important question for us to address. Sure. What, what is the objective of this program? Is the objective, <laughs> it, meaning we could develop objectives throughout the year and so on, but what are we here to do? Are we here to to support another professional in their professional development? And the assessment is, how is this person developing? Is this person becoming resourceful? Are they thinking, starting to think out of the box? Are they trying new things? Are, are they the teachers? Are students learning? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, well, what I'm asking though, I, you know, my position was, and I hear that there's other positions. My position is that you won't necessarily, you, maybe after three years or two years, whatever it is, you'll see that in the classroom. But I think a one measure of success would be that a teacher who came in thinking that, you know, of course I have a curriculum. Here's my Choma Shros. I'm teaching Shros, Perak Aleph, three year days, you know, and that's what I'm teaching. What do you mean lesson planning? What do you, you know, and, and the teacher starts to, to adapt to a professional context by the end of the year, that's huge success, right? Now you may not see excellent classroom management, you may not see um, differentiation, you may not see other things, I, I, because we're, 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 we're catering and we're working with another professional. So, I response, thought, response to that well, please? Can I ask a question of this thing? Yes. It's my impression that my protege has been taught some teaching things. This is not a student teacher. This is someone who has gone beyond. Am I correct? Yeah. Well, uh, not, well in not in my case. Not in all cases. Some, so they, some of them are actually beginning the program now. Some of them have had some teaching experience before, most of them informal education. Okay. And they're taking their first courses this summer. And they're starting in the classroom for the first time, full time. In so the we September. need to show them. So you're absolutely right. There will be things that we can't expect that we need to I think it could depend on the person. When we're talking about setting goals, but meaning that's tremendous success and that's also tremendous success. It depends on the person. It could be this is a person that you say, wow, this person has no idea about curriculum or lesson planning. Hey, what do you think about that? Is that a good goal? Do you want to work on that? And if that's what you want to work on with that person, so then it's fantastic success. And is there a classroom management that can go up? Well, if you're not focusing on that, it might not go up as much. Whereas you have somebody else, so you feel like, okay, they're okay with the curriculum. That's not right. The question right I'm right asking right is now. what's what so is there? Is there, is there, is there a goal and the objectives with your with your protege as you see fit? I don't have to empower you. There's not a vision okay. we have. What has to happen to happen at the end of the first year? Okay. You're so when the question to make comes decision. up, when the question comes up, what what is a measure of success? Right. So the answer is there are multiple measures of success depending on your situation. As defined by your school, your head of school, your principal. So, and as well, and so that's the start in consideration. Okay, how do, we, how, do we, how do we know that we are fulfilling the requirements of this program? You know, uh, you know how, uh, I mean, if we develop it on our own. No, so, oh, that's, so, that's why um, one of us, one of the professors from Watts Raley, is going to be facilitated with, with each, each of you in your schools. We come, actually visit your schools. Did you know that? Yes. We visit, we visit your schools. And we're in contact with you via phone, conversation, and email all the time. So we'll be there to bounce ideas off and discuss ideas. And, but there's, there's not a template, there's not a model that will work for all contexts. 
You'll, you'll hear the principles, you'll develop the, you know, your, your uh, outcomes and so forth on your own, and we discuss them. We're fine. Okay, let me go on, please. Okay. So, um, so induction is, goes beyond just what you do. The, the teacher should be introduced to the school. You know, and, and by the way, you don't necessarily fulfill all, have all those responsibilities. If, if the, the head of school, or vice principal might be involved in this, obviously, introducing the teacher, maybe a, a little write, write about, about the teacher, you know, in a newsletter of some sort. Uh, it might be when you're not available, there should be a buddy teacher assigned to this new teacher. When you're not available and, and she needs to know where, ha, ha, how to Xerox, you know, you know, make copies, or who to speak to about a problem of, of whether it's financial or instructional, whatever, who to go to. So there might be a buddy teacher, usually someone near, near their classroom. You know, or, or in the discipline, or in the grade level, they, they can go to. Um, inter- look at the fourth book, Intervisitations. The, men- the protege should not only be released or see you teach, but why not others? You mentioned why, you know, why should you just learn from one person? Yeah, let them be exposed to as many opportunities as possible. Not all at once, because it may confuse them in the beginning. But certainly, uh, in many schools, even experienced teachers haven't seen each other teach. I mean, you know about each other from the grapevine, but you really haven't had a chance to actually be released to talk about, you know, to watch a Gemara, t- uh, a, a Rebbe teaching a Gemara and teaching a Tosvos and seeing how he does it and then having conversations about how do you introduce Tosvos for the first time and having conversations about that. That's part of induction. Yeah? Uh, that's a decision you'll have to make. I understand. You know, and, 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 and it's also an ethical issue that you have to discuss in you know. Uh, you know. It might be that you're not officially taking them, but they might have observed one. Right. Well, I'm saying I could give them a list. Right? Well, I, mean, I, I know, know this. We'll, 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 we'll know a list of people, but rather talking about. No, I mean, so I give them a list. They're saying four teachers. It happens to be three of them are excellent ones, and one of them stinks. And, um, Maybe well, don't be so overt about telling them. I, I understand. Them, but then you can also just debrief afterwards. What do you think went well? What do you yeah. think didn't go yeah. well? Right. I understand. Is that, is that educationally like beneficial? I'd have a oh. problem with that as a as a fellow colleague that we're that we're snitching on something. Not snitching, <laughs> not snitching, but but showing someone inexperienced a lousy teacher. First of all, he has to recognize that he's a lousy teacher. Second of all, it kind of changes his relationship with that person. It kind of puts him at a different level. Uh, I, I think as a colleague, I would. I mean, and I'm sure everybody can give lists of colleagues. But maybe they stink to us. Maybe we stink to them. I mean, I don't well, know. Okay, so we then, well, okay, so then, you might be surprised by the results. But let's, let's. But I think that, you know, we're not supposed to be evaluated. Well, so if you're not evaluating, is there any benefit? You, you might engage them in conversations about, you know, what does good teaching practice look like? Have you seen teachers teach that you would consider good teaching? What about practices that you're seeing that perhaps are questionable? Let's discuss that. Rather than talk about individuals or through their context, talk about. The pedagogies, the practices that that um, they feel comfortable, that they consider effective. I know they have conversations about that, rather than pinpoint, you know, the lousy and the good, and, and those are labels that may be disabling. You know, Chaim Gannat once said, in the, one of the best books, if I had to recommend the, the, top, the top ten books to read in education, certainly the top ten would be Chaim Gannat's Teacher and Child, The Teacher and Child, where he says labels are disabling, you know, and, uh, and he goes into that, uh, and so... I would um, fo- focus on process, on the process of the activity itself. Can you spell the last name? Uh, G-I-N-O-T-T. I am H-A-I-M. Just Google it, you'll find him. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Your nurturers, did you know that? Yeah, you nurture them. What does nurturing mean to you? You're a role model. You're an encourager. You're a counselor. We're definitely dedicated to that. <laughs> you just fancy that. Awesome, 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 awesome responsibility. Your wife doesn't either, and she has a whole long <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
schar of the of the Shema, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm teaching. Teaching, you know, it's, it's an awesome responsibility. Please. No, just, just sometimes the protege may see things that they can kind of transmit to you, you know, that they may feel, maybe the, the mentor at times may feel a little bit <coughs> And the protege, that kind of changes the role. And I know that that's okay, but I'm still grappling with that. You know, one of the things mentors have the vision is they have to come in and tell the teacher what they're doing right or wrong. As opposed to, I, what about a, a UBD big idea? Big idea is that you hope to develop the knowledge, the skills, the dispositions in these teachers so that, that when they're alone, they become a reflective practitioner. And they're able to see themselves teaching. <coughs> Donald Schoen, S-C-H-O-N, Donald Schoen, wrote a book called the, the Reflective Practitioner. And he said that teachers need to reflect in action and on action. On action means after, after they finish a lesson. One of the first questions I ask a teacher is, I ask them, how, there are several questions you might begin with, how might you teach this lesson differently? And, and they, the nature of their response will tell me whether they're able to actually reflect and see what they've done. They may not be ready with, for that for the first time I meet with them, but I'm, my goal is to enable them, empower them. When I'm not there, and when the supervisor is not there, can they become reflective about their teaching and see, have what's called supervision, and be able to discern things. Now, this may not happen the first year, for some it might. We have some protégés in, protégés in L.A. that are dynamite. They're dynamite. Uh, Rabbi Echelon has one, and Rabbi Lubitz, who are, 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 you know, they came in with all the skills, quote-unquote, all the skills. They did a lot of things. They, they worked on a lot of things, but they, they came with, with a lot of stuff. But um, they were very reflective, and that's one of the things we worked with them on. So our ultimate goal is to, so them to, and so rather than, so we have the notion that we have to tell them. You know, like the, my, my, my vice principal told me things I did right, things that I did, rather than engage me in conversation, engage me in, in ongoing, continuous conversation about what's happening in the classroom. And unless the kids are hanging from the walls and, 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 and being disrupt, disrupt, uh, destructive and causing damage, that you want to engage this teacher in conversation. Supervision. Supervision, for most people, is evaluation. And best practice in the field says supervision is a process of engaging teachers in conversations, ongoing, continuous, collaborative, collegial conversations about teaching in the classroom. How often have you had a real conversation with your principal, head of school, vice principal, about teaching practice? How often are your faculty meetings devoted to come, not, not reading the minutes or not, not planning for the, for the Chag or, the, or for the Seum or for the event, but actually spending faculty meetings, department meetings, conversations about teaching, pedagogy. What do you do? How do you introduce a Tosvos? How do I do it? There may not be a best way, but we have conversations that, and then we, that's what this is about. That's what this is about. Now, do I believe that there are times we need to tell someone, be more directive? Yeah. We, there are three approaches that we'll talk about this afternoon, or is it tomorrow? I think tomorrow, three approaches. The directive approach we use, the collaborative approach, and the self-directed approach. And the terms that's called differently in different, pro different uh, programs. But for some beginning teachers, sometimes some advanced teachers, you need to be very directive, you know? Because they're looking for advice. Sometimes you should be collaborative. Let's, let's, let's solve this as partners. And sometimes the ultimate goal is to be self-directive. <laughs> They come up with the ideas on their own, and you're a sounding board. It's my, very, very much like Socratic dialogue, if you will. You know, right? Okay. Yeah. One of the, I, I learned in Israel, and I started practicing in Israel, but one of the techniques that they used to do on us is videotape our classes. Because sometimes you think you're doing well in class as a teacher, but you're not aware of, and then you would see your, your lesson, and it was like, very obvious. What the first thing I did while, while I was assistant principal is I had them, in those days they didn't have flip, flip, flip recorders, which now they're so small and you know, flick, it, flick it into the machine and email a video uh, recording. 
I asked them to videotape me teaching a 10 minute les a lesson to a fourth grade class. And I used it as a faculty meeting conversation piece. And they, they watched 10 minutes of the clip and they critiqued it or they discussed it. And I tried to get them away from pointing out all the bad things I did, okay? Or all the good things I did. But rather having conversations about what happens between teacher and student over content. Looking at the, what's called the instructional core. You know, how does teacher use wait time? How does teacher pose a question? What do students do when you call on one student? When you, call, when you pose a question, how long do you wait before you call on somebody? And when you call on somebody really quickly, what, what effect does, does that have? You know, uh, do, stu do you repeat students' responses when, you know, and what do other students do? Do they look at you for the, to, for the answers? Do they actually learn from each other? Do they have conversations with, with each other in the classroom? We have conversations about these, th these kinds of things. So I think, I think your protégés should be recorded, not the first day, okay? And maybe as a way, I'm suggesting, maybe that they come observe you.